And as I remind you fine folks that are watching this show every week, we are a Bo Nix program. Eating fourth quarter comebacks like a stud or playing like a chicken with his head cut off in College Station, we ride and die with Bo Nix. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into Monkey Knife Fights College Football Show, Week 11. Here we are. I'm Dan Watkins. Joining me, as always, is the great John McKechnie of rotowire.com. John, what's going on, man? How you doing? And uh, before we get into this, any opening thoughts or big takeaways from the first weekend of Chaos Month month in college football? Oh, man, yeah. Do, doing great. Uh, we're obviously daylight savings time is getting dark. Just uh, like four or five o'clock in the afternoon, so that's a, a buzz kill. But the football, the football remains excellent, so uh, I'm happy with that. And you know, when it comes to the way the first chaos week went, I was shocked at, at how almost like public, like the cat had completely gotten out of the bag when it came to Purdue versus um, Michigan State last week. Like by the time kickoff kickoff happened, anyone that had Michigan state had like disappeared. And like, there was a very vocal, like, Oh, Purdue is like the biggest layup of the week. And I, I was kind of surprised by that. And I felt, I felt that like, uh, TCU kind of got the similar treatment uh, to a lesser extent where it's like, no, nah, man, don't trust Baylor. It's like, well, TCU is completely falling apart and they, and they don't have their starting quarterback. It's like, no, even more reason to, to go with the frogs and uh, the frogs prevailed. Yeah, the uh, the darkness coming early is just all part of chaos month. It just adds. That's right. It adds to the chaos when you have those three thirty kickoffs and it's like dark in the second quarter. It's just it just it just screams just mayhem to me. So my big takeaway, same as yours, it's like is Purdue good? Like is that is that what we're doing now? I mean, it's kind of like because like as I've mentioned multiple times on this show, I'm a Notre Dame fan, and that win is getting stronger by the week. Same with the Wisconsin one. And now it's like, I thought my annual New Year's tradition of just like, you know, watching Notre Dame get blown out with like a hand, like half covering my face, uh, you know, <laughs> on New Year's Eve would, would not be happening this year. But now there is like a legit outside shot of it happening because some of these wins are getting stronger. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Yeah, Wisconsin's playing some of their best ball, obviously having uh, just beaten Iowa a couple of weeks ago and they're, they're looking good. It took care of Rutgers pretty easily. Uh, that's a, that's a good tweet right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, Purdue just they love big game hunting. Um, that's Spoiler just makers. That, that's their thing. And I, I was talking to Nick Whalen about it earlier this week. And it's like if you're a fan of a program like Purdue, where the playoff probably just isn't, especially with four teams, not really something that you can realistically hope for. But you get your chances to have those marquee like field rush games every year. And they're doing it. I mean, obviously, they went to Iowa to, to pull that first one off, but then beating Michigan State after they were in the first playoff ranking, like, that's just got to be so fun. Like, if you're a fan of a program like that, all you want is those, is those marquee wins. And they, they've been doing that for years. I mean, they knocked off Ohio State a, a couple of years ago with uh, with Rondale Moore breaking out. So, yeah, Purdue, um, you know, doctors do not recommend being a Purdue fan, but uh, it, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have another chance with uh, with the Buckeyes this weekend. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's get into the college football playoff. No real big surprise when it comes to the top four. I think pretty much everyone knew what this was going to be when it comes to the teams that would be in as of this week. But a little bit of a surprise there with Michigan jumping Michigan State, Michigan State falling past them. So I thought, John, this week, since, you know, there's not really any big, you know, surprise to discuss, uh, let's our, – our wonderful production team wants to call this segment Say Something Nice – but I was thinking that we would re rebrand re this, excuse me, five word frenzy. So I want you to, ju to just describe each of the top six teams in five words or less. How does that sound? That sounds great. And I, I got it all typed up and ready to go. Like, all right. You want to go six to one? Let's start with Michigan. You want to go first? Sure. Uh, the game is at home. And that, that of course, is in reference to, to them playing against Ohio State to end the season. Um, but yeah, I think that. That's like the kind of like the the silver lining that they get to hang on to maybe is that if you're going to have to play Ohio State, at least it's at home. All right. For me, I got a committee as short term memory, because I mean, apparently two weeks ago is like, you know, months ago now when Michigan State just beat them and now Michigan's ahead of them. But anyways, let's move on here. Cincinnati, I'll take this one and I'm going to quote the finest piece of American cinema. That would be Joe Dirt. And for Cincinnati, <laughs> got to keep on keeping on. Just take care of your business. And you're going to get in. I think that's how it's going to work. What about you? None of that wimpy skull, man. Uh, my, uh, my Cincinnati is, hey, you haven't lost yet. 
that's pretty much the, the best thing you can say about them at, at this point. And that, hey, that Notre Dame win continues to look stronger. But um, yeah, that that they've done everything they can to kind of like erode their public faith, but they still haven't lost. All right. How about Ohio State? Uh, it's there for the taking. Uh, you know, you, you get marquee games. Uh, you know, you got to avoid Purdue now. And then you, you still also have the, the Michigan game as well and Michigan State, too. So everything's in front of Ohio State to really kind of make their statement here as the season comes to a close. Yeah, for the Buckeyes, I'm going all gas, no breaks offense. They just got to keep scoring because the defense, I don't think they really can hold anybody that's any good anyway. Uh, so they just got to they just got to keep putting up points and they'll be OK. Uh, next, we got Oregon at number three. I'm going to go with keep passing these pesky tests. As we saw last week, they went up to Washington, one in the pouring rain. That Stanford loss is, you know, slowly kind of fading away into into distant memory here. And they have that best. Uh, non-conference win of the season going into Ohio State and winning that one. So just keep passing those pesky tests. Yeah, and it's funny that the parallel between Oregon getting ranked ahead of Ohio State with, with the head-to-head win and then Michigan losing to Michigan State and still being ahead of them as well is kind of a funny little uh, neurodivergence from the committee there. Um, but for Oregon, mine is, hey, Travis Dye is good. I don't really have a whole lot else good to say about this team. Uh, the, the offense is not good. They they can do bully ball in the Pac-12 and they'll get away with it. But uh, if they're in the Final Four in December, they're going to get wiped in the in the first round of the playoff. Yeah, Anthony Brown definitely has to step up his game here down the stretch. All right, how about Bama? The tide will roll eventually. Um, I, I think that uh, – Alabama, we still haven't seen their best game yet this season. They don't look quite like the Bama teams we've seen in the in the past. But I just, sort of like the Kansas City Chiefs, like you just kind of still they, – they've built up so much goodwill over the years. It's like they got to snap into it at some point, even if they, you know, struggle against a team like LSU or Florida. For Bama, I'm going struggling but better than you because – Still, it's it's still Georgia, Bama, and everyone else. I mean, I think I'm still still taking the tide in any any playoff game except for against Georgia would be the only team I would not take Alabama. And then finally, Georgia, I'm going with give them the crystal ball. I think at this point, if they don't hoist the national championship trophy, it would be a disappointment in Athens. Oh boy, oh, the expectations I got. I'm trying to I'm trying to remain calm, but yeah, inside freaking out. Um, mine is nice defense. Who's your quarterback? Uh, because that, that's a that's a question that they're going to need to answer here soon enough. We, we saw JT Daniels get his first game action since the Vandy game last week, and he looked all right. They didn't ask him to do a ton, but I think the general consensus around at least the, the Georgia people is that Stetson Bennett can do can be great when the defense is holding up its end of the bargain, but eventually you got to figure the teams are going to score on Georgia and they're going to need an offense that can that can answer with a quick strike, and JT Daniels is that guy. So we'll see if they get that figured out before uh, the SEC championship game. And then we have a bonus one from our executive producer, Jay Rubin. His is, is John Sober January 11th? Yeah, that, that Vegas has, a, has that one off the board. <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. Let's move on. Let's talk about a couple games. And you know what, John? Let's give Cincinnati some love since then nobody else will. Uh, they have a Friday night lights game this week. It's a weird 6 o'clock Friday night kickoff. Really shows just you know how much respect there for that game. Mm. Uh, let's talk about Cincinnati. They're on the road taking on South Florida. Uh, we got Desmond Ritter, 248 and a half uh, passing yards. This is more or less. He's thrown for 249 or more in four of nine games, but just once in the last four weeks. And that was this most recent game against Tulsa, where he finished with 274. USF ranks 114th in the nation against the pass. They're giving up 273 yards per game. This seems pretty easy to me, especially with a guy as talented as Ritter. I'm going with more. Yeah, th- this one was tricky. I-, I thought initially I'd be like, oh, the the more uh, a layup, but you know, Ritter, the the road splits have not been good for him. Like two twenty seven and a half uh, yards per game average. But uh, I think that when you look at the matchup, you have to really take that into consideration. Like South Florida is not just a bad team; they're a very very bad team. So I, I think that Ritter, even though since he should be in the driver's seat for for this one, I, I think that he'll have one of his better road performances. He had a good road performance against Notre Dame, of course. Um, but some of the other performances, at least box score wise, haven't been ideal. But I think this is a week where, where we're, we're able to buy low on Ritter. So I, I'll take that over uh, as well. 
Yeah, it's certainly not uh, B.J. Daniels walking through that door on the other side for South Florida. Instead, it's Timmy McLean. 150.5 is his more or less. He's thrown for 151 in or more in four of eight games this season. Cincinnati has the third-ranked pass defense in the country, giving up just 155 yards per game. I think that's also a little bit about the – says a lot about the competition that they've been playing as of late. Uh, this number is just so low. I'm going to take the more here and hope that they connect on one big play, and that's pretty much going to put me – uh, close to the more there in this one. Yeah, I, I'm with you there on, on the more. Uh, you know, when it comes to McLean, he had he had been banged up with a couple of different things over the last few weeks, but uh, he was healthy last week and, and they turned him loose a little bit. And you figure South Florida, they're going to be in a catch-up script this whole game. He's going to be throwing it a bunch. We're going to see him push over 30 pass attempts. Um, I, I like the chances of, of him just, you know, that number, like you said, is, is low enough to where I'll take the more. All right, let's move on here. Let's talk about some of the bigger games on Saturday. Let's start off at noon, Mississippi State taking on Auburn. And as I remind you fine folks that are watching this show every week, we are a Bo Nix program. We're leading fourth quarter comebacks like a stud or playing like a chicken with his head cut off in College Station, we ride and die with Bo Nix. So let's talk about the man of the hour. Uh, his more or less is 243.5. He's thrown for 244 or more yards in just four of nine games this season. Mississippi State allowing 220 yards per game through the air. Bryce Young, though, did throw for 350 on this team, so they can be beat. Uh, through the air if need be and because this game is in Auburn John that's why I'm going with the more here for our guy Bo yeah it, he just continues to be the the great mystery and you know last week last week he did not really show out particularly well and and uh, you know another problem with with Knicks and when you're when you're betting on his passing yardage numbers those receivers drop everything it's I mean that that's an embarrassing receiving core for for an SEC team to have uh they are at home Bo Nix obviously does tend to play better um at home but I, I think that we're we're going to see a game that doesn't set up for a high passing volume for for Nix I think that they're going to try to keep it on the ground more or or have some more designed runs for for Nix so I think that he he has a good game this week I think this is a good Bo Nix week but when it comes to the 243 and a half, I, I will take the less actually. So you're going with a more efficient Bo Nix game this week. Yes. All right. Yeah. I think the only, the only mystery last weekend, John, and I tweeted this out is how each week I just continue to be surprised on how home Bo Nix and road Bo Nix are completely different people. It is truly, it's truly amazing. I've never seen anything like it. The and, Twitterverse and, wasn't happy with me either. I, I tweeted something along the lines of sarcastic, not that that matters, but <laughs> sarcastically that us real Bo Nix fans, yourself, Dan, John, this show, you know, support Bo Nix at his best and at his worst after he threw like his 33rd interception of the game and fumbled and whatever the hell happened. And most people just responded, yo, he's trash. I was like, well, okay, <laughs> but where's the support? Yeah. Listen, he can do the, he can do kind of like a poor man's Johnny Manziel impression once in a while. And that, that's enough for me. That is enough for us. So let's talk about Will Rogers on the other side. 348.5 is more or less. He's thrown for 349 yards or more in six of nine games this season. He's balling out in that Mike Leach offense. Auburn, middle of the pack against the pass. They're giving up about 225 yards per game. And over the last uh, seven contests, John, he's averaging 378 yards a game through the air. I mean, he's just lighting it up uh, with that kind of air raid offense they got going on there at Mississippi State. And I'm guessing with game flow that Mississippi State's going to be trailing in this one. And Rodgers, I mean, his season low for attempts is 39. He's probably going to be over that this week. I mean, I think I got to take the more here. Uh, how about you? I, I got to take the more as well. You know, you, you see 348 and you start to just kind of doubt that just on principle. But when it's when it's this type of Mike Leach air raid offense and it's going up against a, a decent but not great uh, Auburn pass defense, you have to defer to, to the more here, I think. And he's actually been better on the road this year. Uh, than he has been at home, uh, averaging 407 passing yards on the road this year with a 14 to three touchdown to interception ratio. Uh, 335 is his average at home with a nine to five touchdown to interception ratio. So he he's like the anti Bo Nix. So we, we got a couple of, of just like uh, very polarizing guys um, who can look completely different one week to the next. But yeah, I all said Rogers on the road. Give me the more. 
Yeah, and what what do you make of the uh, Mississippi State kicking situation? Because quite the quote from Mike Leach this week saying that there would be open tryouts on campus for kickers after they missed three field goals last week and ended up losing that game. Yeah, that that was tough. You you feel bad for that kicker to just uh, or your coach to just be like, yeah, I'm ready to just leave him here in in Arkansas, basically. You know, so uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what um what guy that used to punt in high school or was good at soccer that uh, attends Miss State is, is up to this week, I guess. Yeah, some kid on YouTube with the, the trick shot field goals. I think, I think the page. Yeah. Yeah. Donald yeah. destroying or whatever it is that dropped out, became a YouTube, uh, uh, what's it called? Oh, Marco? from Central Florida. Yes, yes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Pre-NIL, he was doing it before his school. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think it's just, it's just, uh, I don't think anybody wants to hear I'm leaving you in Arkansas either. That seems like a very rude. Thing. Please don't. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. We got another great game at noon Michigan versus Penn State. At uh, in Happy Valley for this one, I mean, we know all about Harbaugh and big games, so we'll see what happens this one. Penn State now unranked, so this should be an interesting one there in Pennsylvania. But for this contest, John, let's talk, let's do a little four by four. So basically, if you get all these picks correct on this slate here, you're going to win seven times your buy in. That's a pretty nice chunk of change, depending on how much you play. And let's start off with Sean Clifford 251.5 passing yards is his more or less. He's thrown for 252 or more in four of nine games this season, but he's had over 360 yards in each of the past two games. I mean, now we have the high flying Penn State offense, apparently, they're in Happy Valley. Uh, Michigan is number eight in the country against the pass, allowing just 170 yards per game. Michigan's only allowed two quarterbacks as well to throw for under two over 200 yards against them this season let alone 250 which Bo Nix has to get uh so can Clifford get to this high of a number against this Michigan defense yeah it's it's going to be tough Michigan obviously tough uh, against the pass and then you also factor in you know if Penn State is in these obvious passing down situations you got to deal with that Michigan pass rush it doesn't just have Aiden Hutchinson they, they have Another guy, I believe he's from Scotland. Uh, his name's escaping me, but uh, he was blowing it up against um, Michigan State a couple weeks ago. Yeah, William Wallace. Um, so, but either way, I, I think that Penn State at this stage, they know who they are. They know they're not going to be able to run the ball, spur, uh, especially not against Michigan. So I think a home setup for Clifford, the connection with him and, and Jahan Dotson is, is just on fire right now. Um, I, I think that that's enough to, to push him over that 251 number. So give me the more on Clifford. I like the more there as well. On the other side, you got Cade McNamara, 177.5 passing yards. He's thrown for 178 or more yards in four of nine games this season. Penn State's allowing about 213 through the air uh, per game. When I'm picking this prop, I'm looking at the closer games that Michigan's played, specifically the Michigan State one and the Nebraska games, and even the Wisconsin one. And in all three of those, they trusted McNamara to throw the ball. And in all three of those games, he was over this number. So I'm going to go more there as well, even though he's battling a little bit of an injury. Yeah, that, that's an interesting wrinkle there because it, it's important to know because it, it, in a ideal Harbaugh game, they only have to throw it 18, 20 times with, with McNamara, and then they just bludgeon you with, with the run the rest of the way. So that is a really good point there. My initial lean is, is still on the less with McNamara. I still think even if he creeps in, into the 20s for, for pass attempts, this is a, a good uh, Penn State pass defense, and I think that that Michigan receiving core a little bit banged up um, as well. I know they had a couple guys leave the game Saturday night um, against Indiana. So I, I will go with less on McNamara this time around. And then we got Jahan Dotson, uh, Penn State's stud wide receiver. On the screen right now, it says his prop is three and a half receptions, more or less. But this it might change and go back to his yardage. It does kind of do that on our uh, on our platform sometimes. His yardage on another one of these tabs here is seventy seven point five receiving yards. So let's kind of talk about that because I love the more on receptions there. He hasn't had less than uh, what four. Yeah, his, his low receptions is five this season. I don't think there's any reason to think he's going to be held under three uh, for this one. But anyways, 78 or more receiving yards in six of eight games this season. He's been a monster in the last two games as well. And if we're both going more on Clifford, I mean, he's going to pick up most of these yards, I think, with Dotson catching the ball, right? Yeah, I mean, Dotson has one of the biggest target shares of any receiver in his 
given offense uh, in the entire nation this season. I mean, only like Josh Downs, I can think of, uh, ha has like a bigger share of his offense's uh, target share. Um, so the ball's going Dotson's way that, that I think the more on, on the three and a half receptions is, is a gimme. I think you got to go with, with more there. I think the only thing that would stop that is, you know, God forbid an injury, but yeah, Dotson double digit targets in all but two games this season. And he's starting to kind of break out of the funk. Like Penn state was in a funk there for a while where he was Dotson was seeing like the 12, 13, 14 targets, but you know, turning around like with 60 yards, that, that type of thing. I think last week, not quite what we can expect here, but I think we can expect a strong performance from Dotson where he's busy all day and he, he's productive uh, with it. And then, so finally we got Michigan, and then finally we got Michigan's Hassan Haskins, uh, 89.5 more or less rushing yards. He needs 68 yards for over one, or I'm sorry, no, that's, that's back to Dotson. Dotson needs just 68 yards to get 1,000 on the year. Uh, for Haskins, anyway, he's rushed for 90 or more in four of nine games, but he's also done that in three of the last four weeks. Penn State's allowing about 137 yards per game on the ground, and that's that, I think that's going to bode pretty well for Michigan in this one. Blake Corum also left last week's game after just one carry and was spotted in a boot in the second half. His status for this one is unclear. Harbaugh giving nothing away, so it seems like Haskins is going to be in for a pretty big day after he just had 27 carries last week so i like the more here for haskins yep you, you laid it out perfectly there with with, uh, with blake corm like it's always been tough to to pick between these two running backs but you remove remove one of them from the equation and it becomes a lot more clear i mean you see corm get the one carry last week before he gets hurt and michigan just turns it around and, and gives the ball to haskins 27 times i don't expect corm to be available and if he is I think it would be in a very, very limited fashion. And uh, their, their freshman uh, running back, Donovan Edwards, has been out. And they're, they're not really saying when he's coming back. So this should be the Haskins show in the Michigan backfield. So 20-plus carries. I think that he, he's got that talent to, to go ahead and push over the, the more number. It wouldn't be surprising for, for this number to be closer to 100, I think, by, by the time kickoff goes. I completely agree. All right, John, as we're wrapping up the show this week, we are getting close to the playoff stretch. And like most teams around the country, I think we need to work on our hurry up offense here. So I was thinking for this week to end the show, I'm going to throw you six guys, uh, pass you the rock and uh, hope, and you're going to give me the more or less for them. How does that sound? Sounds great. I'm ready for it. All right, Jay, if we could get 90 seconds on the clock, I think that would work for us. All right. A little post-production uh, magic. Movie All magic, right. if you will. <laughs> All right. So we're going to put 90 seconds on the clock. Let's see if we can fly through these through these six guys. Excuse me. All right. Let's start with Georgia, Stetson Bennett at Tennessee, more or less 177.5 passing yards. Give me less. Um, I, I think that JT Daniels ends up playing more than him th this week. Uh, that's my bold take. So give me less on Stetson. Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud versus Purdue, 335 and a half passing yards, more or less. Tricky. I think I got to go less, though. Um, that, that's just a, a high number. I think he goes for over 300, but but less than uh, 335. All right. Oh, Ole Miss's Matt Corral at home against Texas A&M, 288.5 passing yards. I'll take the less uh, that Corral hasn't thrown it as much of late. I think he'll he'll kind of go back to regular season norms, but A&M's uh, pass defense, in addition to their front seven, too nasty. I think it holds them under. All right, and Zach Calzada on the other side for Texas A&M at Ole Miss, 180.5 passing yards. I'll take the more. He, he's, like, always flirting with, with that number, so it's always a sweat with, with Calzada, even at a not very, like, exciting number regardless, but um, I will take the more. I think he can get it done against Ole Miss. O Oklahoma's quarterback, Caleb Williams, fresh off the bye at Baylor, 241.5 passing yards. I'll take the more. Um, I think that, yeah, they're, they're rested. They're, they're coming off – um, you know, a, a tricky game against Kansas a few weeks back. They had another game since then, but I, I think that they, they let Williams throw it enough. This Baylor keeps it competitive enough to where Oklahoma can't just only go on the ground here. So more for Williams. And finally, Michigan State running back Kenneth Walker the third against Maryland at home, 118.5 rushing yards. I'll take the more on that. Maryland just isn't going to be able to, to hold him up for, for four quarters. It's just not going to happen. The big play is just waiting to happen. All right, there we go. That's our hurry up offense for this week. John, any bonus picks or your pick of the millennium for this week? So on the other side of, of that uh, Michigan State Maryland game, I love picking on the Michigan State secondary. Purdue obviously did a week ago. I think that Talia 
Tagovailoa, I should know how to say that by this point. Oh my God. Um, but he, he's throwing it a ton. I, he has over 300 yards a bunch of times over the course of this season. Michigan State, on average, giving up more than 300 yards through the air. So I like them more for Tago, Tagovailoa. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I think it's 297 when I, when I checked this morning. All right. And my pick of the decade is Brock Purdy. I'm going more than 238.5 passing yards against Texas Tech. Red Raiders defense is just awful. It's pretty much non-existent. I mean, anytime someone wants to throw up 50, a 50 burger on them, they do. And I think Iowa State might even be able to get close to that this week. Purdy's had a rough year, but even he should be able to get to about 250 on this defense. Yeah, I, I like that call. Yeah, Red Raiders, you know, the coaching change and everything. I, I don't know if it, it's going to lead to a, a turnaround. So, yeah, that, Iowa State getting hot at the right time as well. I like that call. All right, John, where can they follow you? You can find me on Twitter at John's underscore tailgate. Uh, check out the Rotowire College Football Podcast as well. We do one on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and also all my other work and, and rankings and stuff up at rotowire.com at slash cfootball. Love it. Great follow. John is a great late night Saturday follow when the uh, college football action is kind of wrapping up. It's, it's, a, it's a good time. I mean, you never know <laughs> what you're going to get from John on Twitter. And you can follow me at Dan Watkins Radio. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button uh, for the Monkey Night Fight YouTube channel. We have all of our college football stuff, our NFL shows, even NBA stuff as NBA season is in full swing now. So hit that subscribe button. And thanks for watching. Enjoy week 11 of college football.